What's up, guys? Here with you with FC Wonder Kid, episode 13. Here with my guy, Bretson. How are you? Howdy. It's uh, episode 13, man. Lucky number 13. Feeling good today, huh? How about you? It's, it's quite, it's quite, for me, it's, uh, I absolutely love this. I'm loving this experience. Like the support on TikTok and YouTube has been amazing. And yeah, it's, it's 13, but you see, by the, <laughs> by the time we're in the 100, it's going to be fast. It's going to feel it fast. Yeah. That, that, that simultaneously makes me happy and sad. Uh, but uh, we, we do appreciate everyone hanging in. We had uh, some technical difficulties this last week. And uh, yeah, as, as usual, like you always say, support has been wonderful. And uh, yeah, let's, let's get into it because um, one of the things we will address in the future is, is shortening the time between when we film um, and, and when we, and when we post, but that doesn't change the fact that, Hey, it's, it's been a little over a week, a little under a week, what a week I'd since week, the Euro yeah. final. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've already lost all track of time and man, that was, uh, that was one for the ages. That was a really good one. Wasn't it? I I'd say it was one of the best euros I've seen and one of the best international tournaments in the past years. I yeah. think your 2020 delivered, as you said in the previous podcast. Mm -hmm. And some players I'd like to highlight. And before sure. I forget him, because in the past podcast, I haven't been mentioning him a lot, but Calvin Phillips. Okay. Like before the tournament, I knew Calvin Phillips was the baller of Leeds. Mm -hmm. But now I think he's the baller of England too. Like yeah. Calvin Phillips has stepped up immensely. And Southgate saw what Bielsa did. And he's really good. He's really good. <laughs> He really, he really is, and uh, you might as well throw in Declan Rice too. Uh, I mean, th those two have—they uh, patrolled that midfield, um, and they were a big reason why England, England was in that first final in '55, flipping years. Um, but yeah, Calvin Phillips, uh, and what a guy! I mean, from from every interview you I've ever seen of him, uh, haven't been able to talk to him yet. But from every person that's ever talked of him. Uh, I, I can't think of any negative that has ever come out of their mouth. Like this isn't a Roy Keane type of thing or an Eric Cantona type of thing where <laughs> you have people on either side of the coin about them. Uh, doesn't change the fact they're both amazing ballers. Uh, but Calvin Phillips is also, uh, <laughs> also happens to be an amazing person from what we see. And that actually seems to be a common thread of that English team, right? And you, you, you got to say that. You gotta it's, say that, right? it's yeah you can see the environment in the group is very positive and uh, you, it's all smiles in the english camp so that's why i was so sad seeing the backlash that sancho rashford and saka got come on they just missed penalties you don't need to get racial about it it's it's quite it's quite sad and people saying oh uh, Saka is ending racism like it shouldn't be a football player ending racism in the uk like yeah it's it's it should be just it it, it should it should just happen you yeah. know yeah. and all my support goes towards sancho rashford and Saka. they're so young uh i'd say i really didn't understand why southgate put them oh. uh, uh scoring the penalties like i don't know what was the so these are inexperienced players okay i'm not gonna yeah. I'm not gonna say he shouldn't have done like if because if the ball had gone in Southgate was a genius, but the mm -hmm. ball didn't go in. So we need to, we need to judge it. And three times, three times the ball didn't go in. Yeah. And, <laughs> and as we've seen the video that, that has come out, he obviously handpicked them. He went up to them. Uh, yeah. There was no, no uh, ounce of hesitation when it came down to it, they were ready. And as Sancho has come out and said, uh, they were absolutely ready for this, but really, yeah, for what was it? A couple episodes ago, I was saying how Gareth Southgate you know, he still deserves a lot of positive clout for for what he has done. I mean, he brought England to their first final in 55 years. But that decision, it baffles me. It just baffled me then. I said it out loud, and I have maybe I, – I can bring my two-year-old in to uh, vouch for me <laughs> here. Uh, but I said it out loud. I said, they're going to lose this. And it, it's not because they're bad, say, penalty takers – but what it comes down to is I don't understand. You're telling me that your three best or three of your best penalty takers on the team are Jaden Sancho. They're all under 23 years old, right? They're all 23. 
it makes no sense to me. And if they are better, let's all be honest. It's a marginal kind of difference between them and say, uh, whoever. Um, so it made no sense to me that he put them on. He put two of them on in the last minute or two of the extra time. I mean, talk about cold entrance. If you're really going to throw everything at Italy in the final moments of extra time, given at least 10 minutes to do something. And then right away, he taps them three, four, five. I, it baffles me. And I don't think it, I don't think it hurts Southgate's tournament because you're always going to make mistakes as a, as a manager, but that one will not sit right with him. It's as if he, he exercised one demon and then he just threw another demon back on his shoulder. Right. It was, it was a bizarre decision that Southgate did. Like, uh, but one thing is for sure. You don't like to go against Donnarumma if it's penalties shootout. This is like, true. Donnarumma, I think it's five and five in his career in penalties and honestly with his height and how dominant he is yeah. like at 22 <laughs> I, it, well, it's not an easy it's, it's Dude, not an easy penalty to score like, no, no. It's... And, and that video of him that video of him that he posted uh where where he was walking away stone cold uh <laughs> he didn't even know that he had won the match he thought there was another penalty that was coming <laughs> Right. And he's walking away as if he's stone cold Steve Austin. Excuse the, you know, <laughs> WWE reference there. But he's walking away and it, it was just so cold. And you have to think about it what this way, moment. right? It doesn't it doesn't matter if it was Saka, Rashford, Jordan Henderson, doesn't matter. It it did feel to me as if he was going to come up before, say, a Jordan Pickford. Um, that he was going to make those those um those on whoever it was that walked up there. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I, I'm with you, Sancho, Saka, Rashford. You hold your heads high because, frankly, you're inspiring a whole new generation of footballers, whether it's in England or elsewhere. And uh, if we could just take the whole race thing out of this, it's just so. I, I'm. I don't want to curse, but it just. It just. It just baffles me. But um, Donnarumma, Donnarumma is inspiring a lot of Italian you, you youngsters too, and Chiesa too. Yeah. Like it's. Uh, I'd say after the the Euros, I do understand now. Donnarumma is going to a hundred percent move from AC Milan. Like Donnarumma yeah. deserves to play at a Real Madrid, at a Barcelona, at a Bayern Munich. Maybe not Bayern Munich right now, but like at a top, top, top team. Like Donnarumma uh, uh, is, and it's deserved to be the player of the tournament. Gigi uh, Donnarumma deserves to be the best player in Euro twenty twenty. He yeah. was crucial. I know he had Bonucci and Cialini in front of him, but it wouldn't have been the same. Like, right. he was too comfortable. Like, too comfortable. And PSG is not too uh, high of a level for him. You don't like that? Well, we, we, <laughs> we, can, we can talk about that later. Uh, but, we'll get to that in a little later. Uh, but I, I, do have to, I do have to say, because you, a good segue into we talked a lot about England. A lot of the controversy was around England after the fact. But, yeah, I mean, you've mentioned this previously. You mentioned it in group stages. I mean, come on. If it wasn't Donnarumma stepping up in the penalties, uh, it was Chiesa in the in the semis, right? Or it was I might have gotten that wrong. It was uh, Spinazzola with with just amazing performances in the group stages. Um, it, it wasn't one person every game, right? It, you could maybe say the Italian midfield as a collective was that one person that just sh shone through every game. Uh, but ultimately, man, I mean this. It was just brilliant to see. It was just this collective nature of a team that, as we mentioned last week, that had been through hell, missing out on the World Cup, yep. and then somehow in the last few years have, have come together, have built an identity, a team identity. Um, and some of those guys that, that went through that misstep for the World Cup, the Andrea Bellatis, um, the Ciro Immobiles, these were the top scorers in that World Cup qualifying campaign that they failed. They failed in the playoffs. They lost, I think, Sweden, right, in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And here they are uh, helping to lead the way, Immobile especially, but with Verratti behind them, with uh, Jorginho behind them. Um, so it's just amazing to me that that team collective were, was able to get through the Belgium, the Spains, the Englands, and, and get this done. So all credit to the Italians for sure. Like you mentioned, like in, uh, all these big nations, but – all these big nations don't have a better midfield than Italy. Yeah, Jorginho right. Verratti uh, uh, and even a Locatelli coming off the bench. Yeah. Barella, <laughs> like the Barella-Jorginho-Verratti trio 
in midfield is amazing. Barella is a stud. Yeah. I don't know why people forget this kid that's balling at Inter because I, I, I don't get it. Why yeah. do people tend to overlook on him? And look at Eli coming off the bench. Like, it's, it's so understandable that every team right now, like in the transfer market, wants him. Yeah. Like Juventus saying we want him. Arsenal wants him. Like it was, a, it was the group true, but you had that the midfield was crucial. If I yeah. had to highlight and the center backs, of course, too the the experience, but the midfield was different class. It was different class. Absolutely different class. Um, I I do have to say though that um, uh, you mentioned this last episode and and it's going to be highlighted now, right? We talked mm-hmm. about if England won, how would they deal with a um, target on their back heading into the World Cup? Well, <laughs> frankly, uh, let's see the French, the Portuguese, the Dutch, uh, the Spanish were so close they could taste it. Um, uh, Brazil losing in in the Copa America final to Argentina. These are like five sleeping, not really sleeping giants, but these are five big teams that very clearly have a lot of quality that are going to be ready for next winter, right? And and they are just chomping at the bit. Now they have to get through club season, right? But they are chomping at the bit uh, to, to really get something done. So I'll tell you what, if, if anything, the Euro 2020 has uh, certainly reawoken um, – a fandom, the positive and negative of fandom uh, in all of us for international football. The, right? the hype is real. The hype is real for yeah. the World Cup because, as previously said, all the nations have to prove themselves in this World Cup. Like, the world's stopping. Like, we have people, have, the football community has needs, and we want to see the big matches. We want to see Brazil against France. We want to see Brazil against uh, Germany. We want to see Argentina against Portugal. Yeah. Messi Ronaldo agenda. Imagine whoa, whoa. if hey, in the hey. World Cup that happened. Yeah, well, Alex, uh, it sounds like you're you're proposing a super league here. So you better you better tread lightly, buddy. No, Come I'm on. just proposing I'm like kidding. the World yeah. Cup that I see every four years. Like absolutely. <laughs> it's nah, absolutely. no, 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 no super league allowed here. No, 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 not here, not here, not with international football. Uh, it it is. It's gonna be. You know, I get it. It's gonna be a different time. Uh, I know over here, I'll be celebrating. Uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving around the time that I'm uh, watching a World Cup. I don't know if that I- excites me or, or weird <laughs> makes me weird feel weird. Um, but really, what it comes down to is, uh, yeah, after what we went through over the last 12 months, uh, you couldn't have asked for a better Euros um, for uh, let, let's let's like call it like an honorable Euros, right? Yeah. The bad only really came out in the end. Okay, there was definitely some booing of national anthems that should not have happened as well. Mm-hmm. But but through and through, I mean, the, the the stuff that we saw, stuff is not the right way to put it. The adversity that was, you know, overcome by the Danish team, um, you know, some of the performances that were put in, whether they were individual, whether they were, you know, team like True. Italy, it, it, it just was so fun. And, I'd like to... I'd yeah. like to just end off, though, like saying that the Euro 2020 admin on TikTok is an absolute goat. Like, he has <laughs> yeah. been so active. And we're not forgetting that mention, which we're yeah. so thankful of. And yeah. one of the best moments ever in social media. So the Euro 2020 admin, you're the real goat. Like, I yeah. just wanted to put that out there. He was, you. He was. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I remember your, your reaction to that, my reaction to that, but, uh, I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Love it. All you right. Well, the so, transfer talk. yeah, it's sad to see the Euro 2020 go, but Hey, here's what, here's what happens, right? Every one of these international tournaments, whether it's the Olympics, whether it's the gold cup or the Euro cup, it leads to transfers. So let's do it. <laughs> it leads to transfers and i think a lot of transfers are leading up to london yeah. okay and i think there's a vacant spot in london especially at at chelsea and that's the striker slot in which i'm just going to put it out there i think chelsea's going to sign or holland or Lewandowski this summer mm-hmm. why because i wow. said it previously chelsea won the champions league without a striker okay Werner isn't the striker that chelsea need he might play as a left winger more or behind the real striker, which I think is going to be or Holland or Lewandowski. Why Holland? Because I see the Chevchenko vibes all around Holland. 
You know, I think Abramovich must see Haaland as the new Jevchenko. Uh, uh, generational talent, scores goals for fun. Marketing-wise, Haaland changes the whole game. He brings so much to the table. Sure. And uh, yeah, a lot of guarantees. And 20 years old. Potential wow. is immense. So I think Chelsea are looking at Haaland. Very, very interesting. And, and Lewandowski. Yeah. Let me His just interviews with... only get better, right? <laughs> True. <laughs> but Lewandowski, Lewandowski, what would he bring? Guarantees. If you're yeah. bringing in Lewandowski, it's amazing to go against the PSG in the Champions League next year. Uh, so I'm excited. And with these moves. Oh, and I, last one, Declan Rice. I think yeah. Declan Rice is going to move to Chelsea. He's finally going to pair up with his bro, Mason Mount. We all want to see it. Rice and Mason Mount back together. Okay. So I think that's. I think Chelsea will want to make that happen too. And 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 who disappears from that midfield? I think I think this. I'm gonna go bold here. I think maybe Conte or Jorginho. I think one of them might leave in the near future. Wow. I think wow. one of them might leave. Is it the right decision? No, but I think one of them will leave. All but, right. But why would you? the decline of rice you know i think rice is a type of player that will play five six years in the premier league as a starter i'm not sure. saying that kante isn't that because he's a for sure is a starter but mm -hmm. it's different you know it, it's kante kante's stock is going to start decreasing so you'd want to sell him when it's high right yeah and it, you know that type of a transfer if you're going to spend big i have no problem with a transfer not that anyone's asking me uh, but I have no problem with a transfer that that improves, say, an organic type of a scenario within a within an eleven, right? Within a club, right? Mason Mount and Declan Rice go way back. Uh, Declan Rice obviously was part of the academy for a while. Mm -hmm. Has played with a lot of these guys, um, and, you know. And that that's that's the type of organic uh, feel you want to bring a little Italy right into the Premier League in terms of their collective nature. Um, if you want a team that can compete every year for the next five, seven, nine years, you, you, you have to do that. And um, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm never going to doubt a Conte or a Jorginho now, uh, mm -hmm. but ultimately, yeah, that, that, that is bold. That is very bold. Um, but, you know, also bold, also bold. Uh, you mentioned London, right? You mentioned it being a pretty hot destination right now. It normally is. Uh, I believe it was Ben White is definitely coming. He hasn't been announced yet. Uh, he might be announced from now until when we post this. Uh, and it looks like that 50 million pound number is correct. And then there was talk also, and it's heating up again, of the Hussein Awar uh, as, uh, you know, coming in as well uh, for that midfield for like another 40 or 50 million. Do you think either of those, well, we know White is probably definitely going to happen. But do you think that that actually accomplishes some things for Arsenal? Well, I'd say I'm not going to say Ben White is a scrub because I think Ben White <laughs> is a decent center back. But right. I think for the price tag you got, that's way too much. Yeah. I think Arsenal got played there because uh, United are, are going to get Varane for how much? I think it's 40 million being talked. Uh, I so think it's 40 million. Yeah. Ben White for 50. Yeah. This yeah. Arsenal, I'm saying it again. Arsenal is becoming a banner club. If you're getting Ben White for 50 and Varane is going to to, to United for 40, Karnate went to Liverpool for 30, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Like, wh what? It's, yeah, and we've we've seen it in the mentions, right? We've seen the, the, the English tax type of thought process there. Oh. But, but we got to remember, this is 50 million pounds for a player. And again, this is not against Ben White. Uh, he is a very, very nice player. Um, but you're paying for, I think he has 26 Premier League, 26 Premier League appearances under his belt. Okay. It might be a little more than that, but he's been on loan, right? I mean, he actually, uh, was Brighton leads, but you know, Brighton's making out like a bandit here with this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's like, Hey, we're going to lose a very top player, but 50, 50 million pounds to a Brighton. Wow. You know? Um, so I, I am confused too. Uh, I was confused the first day it was coming out and I do see a lot of Arsenal fans, uh, attempting to rationalize it and that's okay. Who knows? Maybe he winds up being the, you know, center back for years to come that just ushers in the new era that is Arsenal. Uh, but frankly, but, you could have gotten three in with where you got one. 
but you did mention Usain Uh yeah. I'm going to say what well, my thoughts on Usain Maor is. Usain Maor is, if he arrives this summer, which he should, mm-hmm. uh, it's the type of deal that should have happened a year or two ago. Okay? okay. I, it's yeah. uh, Arsenal had a good enough defense like in the past two years, to actually not suffer the amount of goals they did. They just suffered so many goals because they didn't have quality ball possession. Like, there was no cam. Like, Smith Rowe did step up, and Odegaard did have a couple of good games. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning of season, you need to have that position sorted at cam. And Aouar, I think, I thought he would go to Arsenal. But I'm glad to see that Arsenal are now thinking to get him. Because they need him. And it's I, I'm not a big fan of Arteta, but I can say that I, I do understand that Arteta deserved to have a cam at the start of last season. So give him the give him the cam he needs. Yes. That's, that's uh, that those are my thoughts. Arteta well, yeah. needs a cam, give him the cam. If you're gonna keep him as boss, you know, let him make the decisions. And uh I I don't know, man. I I yeah. Who are, who are we to say any of this? But uh, well, we, Nuntavar Nunta seems to be working out. I know. He got a, he got a goal already. in a friendly, right? Yeah, he did. And it was a nice goal. And he had uh, Mikel Arteta had some very nice things to say about him. So, uh, as, as he should, you know, pump yeah. him, pump him up, pump him up. That's it. I like uh, it. I'd want to, I, 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 had a, I had a deal here that I really wanted to mention too. And that was Giroud going to ask AC Milan. Okay. And I love it. I love this Giroud deal to AC Milan because I think he's going to play. And I feel like maybe he's going to have finally the deserved recognition. Because Giroud is the type of player that scores these wonderful goals. But I feel like he hasn't been given the the time he needs. And I'll never forget watching Giroud at Montpellier uh, behind the Belanda at the time. He was confident as hell at that time. And even at Arsenal, there was a couple of years that he, he knew he was the man. And there were expectations there for him to be the man. But I think it's going to work out. I think okay. it's going to work out for, uh, for AC Milan and Giroud. Yeah, I mean, you see him as, a, as an extension of Zlatan, right? <laughs> uh, but man, you really, you really brought that back with the, the Montpellier uh, reference for him. And, uh, uh, you know, it just... He, yeah, he is going to get his chances. Um, he's he's almost guaranteed to. And AC Milan is um, uh, essentially trying to keep the good times rolling. We got to remember last year for about what seventy five percent of the year they were they were Serie A favorites. Um, they they, they were, were looking good. like they could do no wrong um, for a while. So hopefully hopefully the good kind good times do keep rolling for them. Um, but well, yeah, that, that is, well AC Milan are doing a couple of good deals here with Tonali Tomori. Uh, Magnen, Ma- yeah. Magnen, is that how you say the little goalkeeper? I uh, think former so. little goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. So they're scouting the players really well. I have to say that. Yeah, and they just so, got another fullback, which I don't know what that means for Teo. Uh, but they just got another fullback uh, from Monaco, I believe. Photo Bio Torre. Um, so yeah, they're hey, they're doing they're doing what you expect Arsenal to do: get the pieces of pieces in place before the season starts. Don't mm-hmm. start trying to like plug the gaps as the season goes on, um, because yeah, you know, there's if there's a lot of overturn or a lot of turnover is what I meant to say. Uh, that's pretty tough. So that'll be one to watch. But um, I, I, I got to bring this up because this is a guy that you and I have actually been back and forth with on Instagram. Um, I think if you've ever watched a video of Kamaldine Sulemana, okay, uh, we have a soft spot, a soft spot in our heart. For FC, I'm gonna screw up the the name, but Nordland, right? Nordland, We have a soft spot there. Why? Because these are guys. It, it, this is a a team in Denmark that is committed to playing young players. I mean, I'm pretty sure they had multiple 11s last year that were age 21 and younger. Okay, and Kamaldine Sulemana, um, he just went for uh, for about 15 million euros uh, to Stad Rene, who is not known for bringing in. Uh, a bunch of young talent, except last year they signed on the right side, Jeremy Doku, right? 
And so now you're going to have Kamaldine Suleimana, who, if you look at the stats, if you watch him play, this is a kid that is fearless with the fearless on the dribble. He'll take on anyone and everyone. He might even take on a few too many defenders at, the, at one time, but he's been pretty damn successful at doing it. He was, you know, Ajax wanted him, a bunch of other teams wanted him too. And Stavrene comes in and now they've got one of the, the world's leading youngest dribblers on the left side and one of the world's leading youngest dribblers on the right side. And you've got a team that you you add Marseille to that, you add the moves PSG is making, you add a Lille restructure and Lyon uh, maybe giving a chance to Rayon Cherokee. I want to watch League One this year. I want to watch all of it because it is going to be a wild ride. Stadren is now Dribblers FC with those two moves. Like, I'm right. They're fantastic. <laughs> fant- and before them, it was Rafinha before he went yeah. to Leeds. So yeah. they know their wingers at Stadren. That's 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 a fact there. But it, it, it's an interesting transition too because they're moving from and I wouldn't say away because they still have so many great products in their their uh, system. It, it, they just don't necessarily know how to fit them all in. I mean, they have like mm-hmm. multiple potential world class right backs like Brandon Soppy and and some of these other. But that's another. If we want to do an academy deep dive, we could. But the fact of the matter is like. They're going from developing the Usmane Dembele's of the world, right? Um, the uh, who was another one? Gorkov, I think, was there. Uh, come on, help me out. Who else? Um, it's that train. Well, they got yeah. Kamavinga there, right? Oh, oh, and of course, yes, their their <laughs> jewel, the jewel of their eye, Eduardo Kamavinga. Uh, but they've gone from kind of steered well, they clear got history. Let's say. Yeah, and now they're now they're now they got Doku and they got Sulemana. I mean, they're going to be fun to watch for years to come. But um, I, I mentioned this fast, but and I didn't get a reaction. But I really want to know what are your thoughts on Varane to Man United? Oh, like, like because now Maguire had a good Euro twenty twenty. Yeah, and I think that the center back problem, if Varane comes to United, it's dealt with. Varane and Maguire is one of the best center back duos that will be in the Premier League. I don't think I could agree anymore. Um, the the best center back do is that's probably exactly what I would have said if you didn't, you know, already say it for me. Uh, just think of the, no, the not issues. The, not the best one, though. One, one of, of the, the best. best. Yes. I mean, if you think about their issues from last year, right? It was uh, who lines up next to McGuire, right? Eric mm-hmm. Bailly, constantly injured. Um, you know, nothing against the guy, but... Uh, uh, Phil Jones, no, just kidding. Uh, Lindelof, uh, you know these are these are players that are that are decent. They're good. They're 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 okay. They're whatever, but they're not going to win you the Premier League, right? Mm. Uh, Varane's done it, uh, and him him and Maguire. That is that is just can't get injured. I think I uh, think a player like Lindelof, if it, if if it would have been with Alex Ferguson, it would have been a whole different story. Yeah, but there isn't an Alex Ferguson there now. But I am really interested to see how Lingard uh, copes with this uh, pre- preseason. Uh, do you think he might stay? Do you think he'll be part of a deal, Lingard? Too many good times at West Ham. I, I, I want him. I want him playing day in and day out. He's not going to get that at United. He will mm. not. He's just not going to. Uh, well, I, maybe I'll be proven wrong. Maybe he'll prove them wrong. Um, but 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 no. I want him at West Ham. Uh, or somewhere where he can be uh, you know, loved for who he is, right? Well, he, he, he mm, it's a tough call. I think a team like Everton or even Tottenham. I, th- yeah. I it's he's such a Tottenham type player to go, Lingard. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. uh, I could see it happen, but I don't know. I was thinking about that. But think, talking about a Lingard, let's talk about Calvin Stangs, right? You were really excited about this transfer. Yeah, but you just got me pretty excited that Tottenham mention. Can you imagine Son, Kane, and Lingard working together? That'd be fun. That'd be I, like, fun. I, I like that trio, though. I like that, that trio, That is a great though. trio. Yeah. Now, so, yeah, I mean, back to League One, because we forgot to mention one team that just seems really interesting, and that is, you know, they just poached Chris OGC, uh, or Nice, I should say, just poached uh, Christophe Gaultier, right, from Lille, who mm-hmm. just orchestrated that upset League One win, for sure, over PSG. And now he's gone out, and uh, just like he plucked Casper Dolberg from Ajax um, a little while back, he's plucked Amin Goiri from uh, from Lyon, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alexis Claude Maurice. I mean, you have some young, solid 
potentially very world-class players um, that are kind of aggregating. And that doesn't always lead to a solid 11. They had a rough year last year, right? But with proper guidance and a new addition of Calvin Stengs, who really the only thing on his CV that's to be worried about is his ACL injuries, right? Yeah. Um, he's just a phenomenal kind of multi-tooled player uh, that it depends on who you ask. A lot of people think he's overrated um, and can't do it in a place like League One, but I think he can absolutely orchestrate a defense in League One, uh, an offense, not a defense. Um, and uh, and I think Nice is another another definitely one to watch. Um, they're going for Europe, and and they're expecting that from Galtier. I would imagine nothing less after it's, what. Uh, I, I was surprised that not other teams were trying to ca catch Calvin Stanks for fifteen million. That easy. is a fantastic deal to get Calvin Stanks for 15 million. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Like creativity, passing ability, and product. He has them all. And you're right, it's the injuries, but I'd bet on him for 15 million euros. Oh, I absolutely would too. And 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 frankly, AZ Alkmar, right? I mean, what a they, they just between him, uh Boadu, um, and they've they've actually got some depth there. I'm I'm interested in AZ. Uh, to see Azed, to see whether or not a guy like Hakan Evgen can actually do what he was brought there to do. But anyway, yeah. uh, Boadu is the next one, the next shoe to drop for for them. Um, you know, he's been consistently good for for Azed, and uh, and just like Stengs has been. And I, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see where Boadu goes. Um, but yeah, Stengs to Nice seems like something we're going to be looking back on six months from now and saying that was quite the steal. That was that was the steal. Want to go to the to the to the next topic? Yeah. Well, I you know you called it propaganda. I got to get in one more thing here. Big kind of big moment in U.S. transfers, right? American transfers. These young players are uh, starting to get scouted by the world's best. Okay, um, and two players are going to be going to a Syria club. Uh, we only had previous to that two players in Syria. So you had Weston McKinney at Juventus. You had uh, you have Brian Reynolds who just went and made permanent his move to AS Roma. He'll be working under you know some guy named Jose Mourinho. Um, you have Tanner Tessman who's 19, and Gianluco Busio who's about to follow him, probably within this week. Okay, uh, to a newly promoted club, Venezia uh, FC or Venice FC. So um, this is pretty crazy, and and it's a big moment for anyone that is tracking U.S. prospects. Because I'm telling you right now, this is just scraping the surface of, of what type of uh, overseas market uh, there is going to be for these, uh, these American prospects. Because frankly, 4 million euros for Tessman, 4 million euros for, for Buzio, that is, that is nothing for what they could potentially become. If they become a McKenny or a Pulisic... Uh, I, you, you took the spotlight there. I was going to mention Buzio with the Gold Cup talk. Because uh, I was, I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing. Like Busio is, like I went to see more footage, mm -hmm. and you're right on him. Mm -hmm. Like Busio for he, four million. Yeah, is that the amount he's going to to say? Yeah, I could be wrong, but that's what I heard quoted. And it's Steel. Um, Steel. Uh, yeah. you're, you're right and, with that. Yeah, and over the last year, he's done it at the six, he's done it at the eight, and at the ten. Um, and I, as the world, a big game tonight versus Canada. Uh, for the Gold Cup, but um, as he's handed the keys in this particular instance, running kind of like our B, B minus team in the Gold Cup, mm -hmm. um, it'll be very interesting to see, yeah, where w what he can do against a full, fully uh, strong Mexico team. Come on, it's he, just your B team, but you still have a couple of players that are, that are interesting for an A team. I think Daryl oh, DK is starting to make an argument that he's the target man for the U.S. men national team. I think you might be right. And I, and here's here's my quick reminder to you that Daryl DK is younger, I believe. I believe he's younger than Josh Sargent, who is basically seen as the uh, number one for the striker position for the U.S. men's national team. So Daryl DK is a, is a house, and he's only just scraped the surface. You get him in the right situation um, – I mean, he, he could be very, very good. But I, it, you, well, let's move on from transfers. We can go to – we were mm -hmm. going to do Gold Cup, and you, yep. you made the segue there. Uh, yep. And you've been watching the U.S. team. I like it. 
What else have you seen um, in the Gold Cup since you've been uh, kind of flirting with a territory you don't normally go into, right? <laughs> true, true. I I'll be honest, I'm loving this tournament. I love the Great. fact that it seemed like Qatar is involved yep. in it. It's it's an interesting wild card being mentioned. And it's always a different team, right? So mm -hmm. our listeners that don't know, the Gold Cup is a Central America tournament, right? Uh, calf. So it's Central America and North America. In which the the teams there's like a invitation team like Qatar, yep. and they have the opportunity to play against these teams, which has Mexico, Canada, U.S. And it's really interesting because I was watching this Qatar team, and I didn't know this player, Ak yeah. Akram Afif, I yeah. think that's the name. Two two games, two goals, and Pedro Miguel. Uh, I saw that he was a former Farins player. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming he's from Portu Portuguese descendant, Pedro Miguel. Like mm -hmm. the name doesn't lie. Uh, <laughs> and he plays for Qatar. So uh, I was doing my digging there and I found that really interesting that a, a team like Qatar was in, a, in the Gold Cup. Yeah, uh, for, players, for players, yeah. I'd like to mention Eustakiu. Uh, Eustakiu is the engine of the midfield, uh, the Canadian midfield. He mm -hmm. scored a fantastic free kick. Uh, I think it was last game, uh, and yeah, Hoyla too. Yeah. I I wanted to say to the listeners, I remember playing FIFA 08, FIFA 09, and Hoyla was was <laughs> like the next big thing at Blackburn, Blackburn Rovers, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he was he was like the wonder kid, the wonder kid at the time. Uh, yeah, and yeah. you have you have a lot of things happening, and Mexico. I think Mexico, with the team they had, they were favorites. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of expecting Mexico to, to win it all. Yeah. But... Mm. I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I mean, I'm definitely with you there. They have the strongest roster on paper, and it's going to take an upset. And and frankly, you know, like if Canada had Alfonso Davies and Jonathan David, uh, Davies pulled out uh, via injury uh, previous to the first game. Um it's going to take a lot uh, or it's going to take the ascendancy of, uh, you know, a, a actual team team movement. But but Mexico clearly has uh, some of the strongest players. Cool thing about Akram Afif, um, if you ever get the chance and, and you, you and I talk about it every once in a while, these AFC Champions League teams. I mean, he he is prolific. I believe it's for Al Saad. Um, I think he's got like, I don't know, like 60 some goals in 60, 62 games and the kid's only 24. Um, there's just, it, it'd be interesting for us to do an episode one day of Asian players, uh, have an expert on because neither you and I are probably experts at this and kind of walk through them because it's, it's a whole new market, a whole new world, uh, that has not really been tapped into by say the Western hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would be really, really uh, cool. But from a gold cup perspective, um, yeah, Canada also has Kyle Laren, who I know you were going to mention, yeah. Um, yeah. He is, he is coming off a phenomenal year. Uh, there was one point about eight, maybe 18 months ago where you looked at Kyle Laren and you said, he needs a new adventure. He needs a new place to go to. Well, he went to... Exactly. And then he was he was amazing for them last season. Um, I think there was one game he had five goals in a game or four goals in a game. Uh, oh. He's just phenomenal. And I, I envy uh, having him up top when we're trying to, you know, find our next forward for the future. So, yeah, Kyle Aaron's great. Mm -hmm. And the Canadian team is very interesting because you, if we mention here the names, Alfonso Davis, Jonathan yeah. David, Stephen Ostakiu, mm -hmm. Hoyle, Kyle Laran you mentioned now. Yep. So I, I, I'm liking the shape of this team. It's yeah. There are no scrubs. There are no yeah. scrubs, and, and uh, you got to add uh, their newest uh, breakout star, which is Buchanan, Tejon Buchanan, who plays for the New England Revolution. And I'll tell you what, you, you look at this team um, and you say, this is probably a team that, that should be able to get to the World Cup. And it's been a long time since Canada has been in the World Cup. So um, we've got to start with the Gold Cup first and then move from there. But uh, exactly. let's, let's, uh, let's jump into, you know, we have the Olympics starting. Uh, yes. I believe the games start a couple days before the actual opening ceremonies, but mm. for people that don't aren't necessarily, um, you know, students of the Olympic game and watch maybe track and field instead of this, 
Uh, the Olympics are interesting because technically you're not allowed to bring under 20 or over 23 players, except every roster is allowed, I believe, five older players. Uh, and then you're supposed to be U23 or U23 at the time when the Olympics were supposed to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, so not surprisingly, there are some amazing, amazing players. Uh, but let, let me just tell you, in the last four Olympics, no European team has won, no Asian team has won. It's been all the Americas. It's been Brazil, Argentina, or Mexico actually won a gold medal. So it'll be really, really interesting to see the first mention I'm going to make right now is that the Spanish national team is going bold. Are they not? <laughs> right? They are bringing Pedri. And I know you said that, that he might be not be playing, but I don't think he's going to go there to just ride the bench, right? Uh, so after like 66 fixtures this year where he pretty much played 90 minutes, he's going to go to the Olympics with a Dani Olmo, with a Brian Hill, with a Eric Garcia. I mean... Their intent is to win this thing, is it not? Like, if you have Dani Olmo and Pedri in the Olympics, you're favorites yeah. automatically, <laughs> automatically after this season. But I'd like to say this before I start mentioning here players and about about the future tournament that we're going to see. I'd like mm -hmm. to say it's not fair on these athletes. Okay. I know that receiving an Olympic medal is something incredibly honor honorable. Mm -hmm. Like, it's you're an athlete and it must be such a good moment for you to receive that medal but the football players are after a long long season and yeah. you mentioned pedri which is the fantastic example he's 18 he's played more than 60 games this season you're gonna you're gonna tell him oh you want to play in the world cup i'd say of course he's gonna say yes yeah he wants it he yeah. wants the silverware but is it right i think we should we should start thinking about maybe having an alternative towards this maybe having yeah. the olympics at the time a little bit more, a little bit at a different time earlier or after the olympics yeah, yeah. the original with all the all, all the other sports i don't know and it's already been made public i mean ronald coleman has already basically come out and said i really wish pedri was not going to the olympics right he needs a break and i'm going to give him a break but at the same time it's it's like Gareth Southgate going up to Bukayo Saka saying, "Do you want to take a penalty in the Euro in the Euro final?" Kid's not going to say no. He's a freaking baller, right? He's going to do it. And if somebody asks you to play in the Olympics, very few young guys, right? Very few twenty-one year olds or twenty-two year olds are going to say, or even younger, right? Like mm -hmm. Pedri, eighteen, are going to say, "Oh no, coach, you know what? I need a I need a break." They don't, they don't think like that because they're all ballers and all they want to do is ball, you know? Um, so that's why you see names like Takafusa Kubo on here. Uh, you know, there's but just so many Kubo good names. Kubo is understandable, though. Olmo well, and Pedri is different. Like, yeah. <laughs> Olmo, I, I, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I think I, met, I misspoke in that sense because I actually meant to say Richarlison is, a num is number one Ooh. thinking because he just played the Copa America with Brazil, right? Think. yeah he definitely did and now he's now he's heading to the olympics but then again then again five years ago neymar neymar won gold right mm -hmm. four years prior to that neymar won silver i believe because mexico beat them in penalties in the final so you know you do have players pulling this double duty or triple duty uh but it, as we mentioned when we were talking about the euros and everything like that it's just getting to be a longer and longer and longer season every time. And it, mm -hmm. it's going to lead to a whole lot of injuries that should not be necessary. I think money. that Brazil team, like the Brazil team, uh, I saw the names and you, Renier, mm -hmm. uh, he might have something to prove himself. But I think the, men, the, the name that everyone at home needs to remember, in my opinion, in the Brazil national team, is Gabriel Menin. Because Gabriel Pnin is so versatile, and he can play at wing back, he can play at mi in midfield, and even and he can, he can, he can even play at striker if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, well. Uh, so if you could remember a name for the Brazil team, Gabriel Pnin, okay, yeah. Palmeiras kid working with Abel, unbelievable. Yeah, that's he's a coming good to shot. Europe. Yeah, he's coming to Europe, and he's going to take over. He's yeah. going to take over. That's a good shout. And, and I know there have been some uh, Brazilian supporters that have come out maybe against 
him. And I'd love to know in the comment section, you know, why they don't see him. Because everything I've seen of him, what I've seen him play in the Copa, Copa Libertadores and, and other um, places, uh, he looks every bit uh, the future stud. Um, and he's already got a, a, a Serie A title, you know, in Brazil under his belt. So uh, the three I'm looking at, though, on Brazil, though, are the three that need this the most, right? Mm -hmm. And that's got to be, to me, Paulinho, Bayer Leverkusen, right? Mm -hmm. Rainier, who you already mentioned. Um, I think he's still on loan with Dortmund. Um, and then Gabriel Martinelli, who's coming back um, and is hoping to make a, I know Arsenal fans feel this way, are hoping, uh, is hoping to make a big, big, big um, impact with the Gunners. Uh, but these three need this, right? Because either injury layoffs or just not playing, um, they're, I'm going to be watching them a whole lot for this Brazilian team, and I hope they play. Uh, but th that'll be really interesting. Anyone else on those rosters that, that intrigue you? Uh, I'm going to mention Brian Gil because I think Brian Gil is a player that's very overlooked. I think if Brian Gil played for a, a bigger team, people will be going crazy on him. Yeah. And I think soon they will. It's another, it's another name that it's good for you guys to know. Brian Gil, winger, uh, technically above, above the so rest. Very yeah. good and pace wise, he's the type of player. Not he's not high with loads of pace, but he's got enough pace to get past uh, fullbacks. Uh, but the player I really wanted to mention going to the Olympics, it's Man United fans will be getting excited maybe with this one. It's Ahmad Yalo. Yeah, uh, I think now with Sancho coming in to Man United, Diallo must be thinking, well, it's time, man. I gotta prove myself and. Well, the Olympics, that could be the stage that he can prove himself to get a really good loan. Because right now, I think he could be loaned to the cha a championship team. I think he wouldn't be loaned to a Premier, a Premier League team. If he has a good Olympics, maybe Bielsa, maybe a Wolf, no, Wolves, no. But Leeds, uh, Crystal Palace could fancy him. I don't know, but uh, I think he has to prove himself in the in this Olympics. And yeah, I'm, and, that's my shout out. And, and to be honest, that, I mean, that's a great shout out because that Ivory Coast team um, is probably hoping to be the Nigerian team from five years ago that I think won bronze. Uh, and the Japanese team that's going, I look at their roster and I say, wow, this team has the possibility of being, uh, I believe it was either Japan or South Korea, you know, eight years ago or five, or two Olympics ago that finished, um, it, it was bronze. Uh, medalists there so you have to think of it some of these these younger players on these lesser known teams right or lesser covered teams maybe not lesser known like an ivory coast um this is an, a, a tremendous opportunity for them right mm -hmm. because it's another tournament that otherwise they're watching maybe the african nations league okay um or they're watching the afc champions league or you know some something of that nature whereas the olympics will be watched by a whole lot of people, um, and it, whether it's an Ahmad Dalo or a Wilfred Singo or um, you know a Ritsu Doen or a Takahiro Tomiyasu, who who like, likely could be going to Tottenham soon, okay, mm -hmm. potentially, um, these are players that can raise their profile and have so in the past. So the transfers do come out of here, even though it's technically a amateur tournament. So. Uh, always good stuff. Always. I know more football doesn't necessarily mean good football, but <laughs> Hey, continue the summer, right? <laughs> facts, facts. You want to go to the rebuild? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So the rebuild this week, we wanted to go bold like PSG. So mm -hmm. that's what we're going to go through. Um, like, what are your thoughts overall? PSG? Well, I mean, my, I, I think... I think we probably should have done this maybe two weeks ago before they started their flurry of intent, right? I mean, we now know exactly what they're going for and what they expect. Um, I think it's whether or not uh, they have the uh, ability to plug their weakest spots, which I still mm. believe is what? Left back? Maybe a little, uh... a little more cover up top. Um, because if an Mbappe or a Neymar goes down, what do you got? But... Ultimately, I mean, let's let's mm. start from the beginning based on what has already come in the door, right? Yeah. What what would your eleven be uh, if we're going that three four three that we talked about before here? 
Exactly. Uh, I think the the tactic that it's it's bold. I think some games having footage would be would be good, and others no. I think the three four three would be the boost tactic mm. for PSG because PSG would play with Donnarumma, Ramos, Marquinhos, and Kimpembe, and uh, this trio at center back and Donnarumma would make them Champions League contenders straight away. So yeah. if that if they can make it happen, why not? Yeah. And I'd put the wing backs Bernat and Akimi. I think them just figuring out that right back uh, or right wing back in this case scenario was yeah. more important than the left back because was it uh, Mitchell Baker um, at right back last Champions League? Yeah, now at Leverkusen. And he was extremely exposed. He yeah. he he's more on the center. He likes to play more at center back, right? Mm -hmm. And putting him at the right back spot, I, Neymar was going bonkers in him. There was like a video of him yelling, doing faces, saying, ah, oh, th oh, this is not, basically saying, this is not the guy. This is okay. not the guy and get me a right back. They got yeah. him, Akimi. So uh, uh, I, I think the right backs, Akimi and uh, Bernat. And then in the middle, I'd put two midfielders and that, that would be Verratti and Wijnaldum. Which yeah. can then get the support more of a Ramsh or a Merkinj more coming to that CDM spot if we're going in-game play. If they sure. need more support in midfield. Yeah. And up front, look, I think it's simple. Just put Neymar. Julian Mbappe. Draxler. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. You know what? Like... I, ru I ruined your vibe. I, ru I ruined your vibe. Work it up again. <laughs> Who, who's your three? Who's your three for PSG? Look, your if, you, if you talked to me 10 years ago when I was playing like FIFA 10 and FIFA I 11, I was hyped up with Draxler uh, at Schalke. Okay? I remember like those days. Rakitic. Yep. Like, but now, the vibe <laughs> at Draxler is completely opposite. Like, uh, I'd put Wijnaldum and Verratti and then Neymar, Mbappe and Di Maria. And yeah. I think he's the overlooked uh, gem here. Di Maria. Yeah. Next to Neymar and Mbappe, Di Maria manages to outshine them sometimes. Yeah. In the Champions League, he received the Man of the Match award in a pretty important game. And yeah, people need to start giving the respect to him. And I want to say this. I saw an ESPN FC uh, prediction lineup without Marquinhos. Okay, yeah. boys, you think Marquinhos is not going to play who is the captain of that PSG squad. So you're telling me the captain is going to be on the bench. Yeah. Yeah. They got, I, they got prop <laughs> luckily they, they properly, uh, properly got ridiculed for that one. Cause I, uh, I'm pretty wait, sure wait, wait, they showed all over the place. And, and, and Marquinhos had a, an excellent Copa America. I know. Yeah. So why you need to start Marquinhos? Like, ah, oh. yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is, you know, I, I think here their, their depth at the center of defense is just beautiful. I mean, you even have, uh, uh Tilo, uh, Kerr, uh, Abdu Diallo, uh, these guys can play across the back, you know, that's not, that's not bad. And then in the middle, you still have Herrera, I believe, uh, yeah. and gay. Um, and then up front, you got a Cardi and Draxler. Um, but it, I, I have said it, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I really do believe that there needs to be another youth breakthrough here that helps plug the gaps when the fixtures get too congested, mm -hmm. um, because I don't think they're going to be able to go out and and pry. Uh, I don't know. Add more to the the salary um, salary binge that they're going on. But one thing one thing that just blew my mind in looking at PSG, Marco Verratti has been there almost a decade. That is. Yeah unbelievable i i i just I, I don't i felt really old when i when i uh <laughs> when i saw that i think he was signed in like 2012 from pescara and, right yeah from pescara for like 12 million euros which i guess back then oh, is like 17 guys you're giving me i remember when i was a kid saying oh verati he's really good on football manager yep. then psg getting him my friends all saying who's verati who's verati yeah you think i like a genius to know about him but that's true like really good snatch that's an underrated snatch up Verratti to PSG. It so is. It really is. And and I'll tell you what, the other thing I, I in doing my research on this, you know, I really do believe, and I think Sergio Ramos has come out and said it. One of the biggest reasons why he signed for PSG, paycheck's nice, I'm sure. Uh, but one of the biggest reasons he signed for PSG was Neymar, right? Uh, they yeah. might play for different teams, uh, you know, uh, coming up through uh, plenty of uh, Classicos. Uh, mm -hmm. But... 
really what it comes down to is they've built a relationship. They respect each other as footballers. They respect each other as people. And uh, I, I think Sergio Ramos, uh, when Neymar probably gave him a shout and said, hey, I want you to be a part of this. I want to get this done, this well, champion mm, league truth done. Be told, like, truth be told, I think now Neymar is getting to the situation that is. Mm -hmm. I'm, 20, I'm 29. I'm not a Nike athlete anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's with Puma. And he needs to step up. I think if Neymar doesn't get the Ballon d'Or, Neymar won't be seen as a better player than Ronaldinho. Mm. Okay? At this moment, I think Ronaldinho is above Neymar. Mm. But if the Champions League comes, I think Neymar is going to win the Ballon d'Or. And I think he knows it. But I think the plan wasn't well done. I think Neymar should have stayed a bit longer at Barcelona. And maybe when Ronaldo left Real Madrid, that slot with Rodrigo, Vinicius Jr., Casemiro, right. Marcelo, Meto Neymar, put Neymar there. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that was, that would have been the right move to do at the right time. But I, I think, I think what happened was PSG came with the money and that's it. But yeah. will he get the Ballon d'Or like that? If it comes, like, I, I'm thinking about this on the spot now, and would Ronaldo or Messi five years ago with this team win the Champions League? I say yes. So, Neymar, you got to win it. You got to win the Champions League. If he doesn't, there goes his legacy. It's, 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 I'm not, I'm not, there goes his legacy. Like, Neymar is going to be like Allen Iverson type beat. Right, right, right. You know, everybody yeah. loves Allen Iverson. But the truth is, he didn't win the medal. He didn't right. win that ring. Neymar, you're not going to win the Ballon d'Or if you don't win the Champions League. Hey, you just you just sullied a Philadelphia athlete's name. Come on. <laughs> we, we love our Allen Iverson here. Uh, it, he's, he's what made me a basketball fan in the first place. So, um, But, yeah, uh, no, I, I agree with you. And, man, you, you, you like to go down those rabbit holes of what ifs. Um, my, my brain can't even wrap around that. But uh, – don't I'll you tell think you what. Ronald would win it? I think Ronald would yeah. win it with this PSG side. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, Messi up until uh, about a week ago when there was almost certainty uh, behind him taking a big pay cut and having another five-year contract right ahead of him, um, there was a very real possibility that PSG was going to attempt to splash the cash on him. Could you mm -hmm. have, have, a, have ever imagined that? Um, but yeah, CR seven there too. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, or I not honestly, two, but yeah. I honestly think that, uh, PSG had to make a decision with the salary cap. Like, are we going to get Rams and Donnarumma or right. are we going to go big with Ronaldo or Messi? And I think they made the right decision. I think getting Rams and Donnarumma is a better call than getting Ronaldo right now. I that's agree. bold. <laughs> that's bold. I think that's, that's bold. Like, oh. I, I can't believe I didn't pick one off once. Uh, well, yeah, you didn't. Hey, you didn't pick him for the Euro 2020 team of the tournament too. It was yeah. the golden boot. Um, no, not to. I I agree with the reasons why you why you didn't there. But the other thing that's very odd here because you know you know Donnarumma is a PSG player, and you've also got a still he's aging some, but mm -hmm. you still got Kaylor Navas, right? You, th you still got Alphonse Areola. You still got, you know, six other professional goalkeepers on PSG, all of which need to be offloaded in some way, shape, or form. Um, but to have a guy like Kaylor Navas um, competing with a, with a Gigi O'Donor Ruma, oy, oy, oy. I mean, there's going to be somebody that is going to be very unhappy for the majority of the year. Second time it's happened to Navas, right? First it was with Courtois, yes. now mm -hmm. with Donnarumma. Like, I... I, I... <laughs> I'm not going to say that PSG shouldn't have got Donnarumma because Donnarumma, come on, <laughs> best player in the Euros. Yes. But it's... It's, Con it's CONCACAF discrimination. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> it's regional discrimination. It's uh, just kidding. It's because he's no, Costa Rican, I guess. Um, Navas deserves more respect. A hundred percent. What a player. Nav yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the Champions League wins the Ronald got a Real Madrid. Navas had a role in that, an important role in that team. Yeah, yeah.
Absolutely. Well, well, we got four yes. minutes left. Do you have any Wonder Kid mentions you want to do? Like we were. Yeah, you know, about. there were a couple this past week um, that were really, really interesting to me. Uh, a couple shout outs. Um, you and I have been back and forth with him also on Instagram. And he's going to be, you know, with Red Bull Salzburg um, offloading uh, mm-hmm. some of their best players, Pats and Daka to Lester. Uh, yeah. Benjamin Sesko, and I don't know if that's exactly how you pronounce his last name, Sesko. Yeah. Um, he is uh, definitely one to watch. He scored two goals in his first match. It was a cup match. So they destroyed some lower league team. Um, but Sesko, I believe is 18 Slovenian, um, Karim Adeyemi, Brendan Aronson, Okafor. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've got some players that you're always going to want to watch because they're next year's Pats and Daka or they're next year's Erling Holland. Nice. Um, so you really, really do want to look at them. Um, the other one we forgot to mention within the Gold Cup, Matthew Hoppy. Okay. Yeah. Matthew Hoppy did not score. I think he got an assist, though. It was a very nice assist. You're going to want to watch him because there are a lot of teams sniffing around him in a good way. And it, it's, it ranges from a Tottenham to a Newcastle to a bunch of Bundesliga teams. Uh, but he's a kid that, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't score five goals in what three games, uh, for no reason in the Bundesliga. So for you uh, to see, like for you to see, I add on my notes, Matthew Hoppy, yeah. uh, 20 super creative. Yeah. Like I watched the footage and the creativity he has, I wasn't expecting it for a U.S. player. Mm-hmm. Very good. Finding the goal. He's yep. very good. Finding the goal. Wasn't expecting uh, it. I will be very interested to see what he does uh, against the Canada or against the Mexico. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, Hoppy and Daryl DK up top there makes me really interested. And then the last one, this kid is 16 years old. So if you want to feel really, really old, you want to feel really old. He's a 2005. Um, uh, but Club Bruges, uh, you know, these are lesser known teams than, say, obviously the Real Madrids and the PSGs that we talk about. But Club Bruges has, has been pretty much taking Belgian football by storm recently, ever since Yori Tielemans mm-hmm. left uh, Anderlecht back in the day. Um, and they entrusted in the Super Cup yesterday in their 3-1 or 4-1 win over Genk. Yeah. They entrusted a 16-year-old, number 72, Noah Mbamba. And um, this kid is, first off, he doesn't look 16. He looks like he's 35. I mean, he's physicality. Uh, he also has technical, tech, not technicality. He's very technical in nature. Uh, took on some players, hard tackler, um, endless engine. I don't I think he played only 80 minutes or so of it, but kid was entrusted with a center of midfield uh, on probably the top team still in, in uh, Club Bruges. And nobody, I mean, Noah Lang in that team, uh, Bastos, no all Lang. these guys. Have, oh, yeah. Noah Lang is a stud. They are oh, all saying great things about this kid. And um, I, you got to watch him. He can play center back. He can play CDM. Um, he's a really, really fun one to watch. And he's 16 years old and doesn't turn 17 till January. That's a good mention. That's a good way to end the podcast, right? Like, remember that name. Blue yes. Bruce Prospect. Okay, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed FC Wonder Kid episode 13. Leave your like. It's extremely important. Like, it helps us a bunch. Comment down below what other topics you like us to talk. And again, thank you for all the support and every platform. You guys are the best. And yep. we are here to stay, guys. So you trust bet. us. All right, Alex. Till next time. Yeah. See you then.